There's a French verb with no English equivalent. I'm sure there's equivalents in other language, but um, and one can explain the concept, but it's it, as a word itself, it doesn't exist in English. The the verb is falloir, um, and we may know the word from the French expression comme il faut. Um, it's roughly translated as this is the way things are done. Um, it's not this is the way things must be done. It's just this is how, it, it, this is the way of things. Comme il faut. You're doing it comme il faut. The way it is to be done. Now, it doesn't mean that the French embrace this idea, but they sort of do in certain ways. Um, if you've ever noticed the way the French eating habits work, they're quite different from the English-speaking ones, and it's very much based on the idea of on mange comme il faut. We eat the way it is done. Um, it's, you know, sort of uh, often it's compared to the English as we eat to put food in our bellies, they eat as an action in and of itself. Um, and there's a, an art to actually eating, not just in terms of cooking and preparing the food, but in the actual act of eating. On mange comme il faut. One eats the way, the way it is done. <laughs> it is the way of things. Now, that whole idea, I think, suffuses our civilization, and I'm just using the French word here, um, to a much greater extent than we realize. Uh, it's just the way of things. And our taboos are often based on that. They're, I think they're subconscious. I think, uh, as Fede said, it's just we're programmed culturally that way. And it's not as though there's something consciously programming us. It's just that our society has evolved in certain ways. And we have, I guess, the old terms of folkways and mores that we just inherit. And we don't really question them, or a lot of people don't question them. Um, now, I'm perfectly prepared to question them. I'm one of my one of the advantages that I believe myself to have in life is that I'm in extremely adaptable. I'm perfectly okay in surroundings that are completely alien. It it doesn't bother me in the least to be a foreigner in a country where nobody has anything in common with me. In fact, I rather like the experience. But most people actually just want to live within the matrix of a set of rules, and it's interesting, eh? Within the matrix. It's related there. Um, now, that's that's okay. I'm not saying that, that, that people shouldn't be like that, that people shouldn't live comme il faut. They shouldn't, I'm not saying that people have no business just following the rules of their society or the going with the flow, as it were. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Some of us don't subscribe to that point of view. In fact, to, to some of us, that's kind of poisonous. Um, and again, it's, the, the, I, I like to point out, I hasten to point out that it, when, when the French use the term comme il faut, they're not really saying that that's exactly the way it is. They're referring to that kind of mindset. Um, as the French can be just as open-minded as anybody else. In fact, in many ways, they're more open-minded. Um, but it's this idea that there is a right and a wrong way to do things. Now, I contrast that with, I contrast that view that, you know, it's just the way of things with um, Socrates' aphorism, the unexamined life is not worth living. Now, if you live comme il faut, you're not really examining your life. Now, <laughs> I would say that most of us live comme il faut. Most of us live according to the way of things. And in that sense, I guess we can say that Socrates was saying that the way that most people live is not an avenue worth pursuing. But I counter that with, who was he referring to? Was he saying that the unexamined life is not worth living for everybody? Or is he saying the unexamined life is not worth living for those who are awake to what reality really is? Um, 
because again, when you look at the, this, the uh, simile of the cave, the allegory of the cave, he implies that, or Plato has him implying that, uh, most people do live in this state of darkness where they don't understand what's happening around them, or they don't understand what's happening, as it were, behind the scenes of our normal existence. Um, but they do seem content with the way it is, even though they're prisoners in a dark cave. They have adapted in, in, a, in a way, although I suppose we can't really say they've adapted because they never were anything other than prisoners, but they have evolved, I guess, to, they've evolved a mythology to explain the situation that they're in that is ultimately, it's implied, a delusion. In other words, they think that all the shadows that they see on the wall are real. When they're not, their image is deliberately projected for them to see. But they've created this sort of deliberate self-delusion in order to make their lives manageable and worth living. And if you asked any of the prisoners, presumably they would say life is just fine down here. This is the way it's always been. But if, you know, you're the person who either was kicked upstairs or walked upstairs and came out and saw what everything is really like, what the sun really looks like, what the birds in the sky actually look like, um, you and you went back down, you may, or you may not, but you may conclude that life in the cave ain't worth it. There's something of this story of um, being booted out of Eden and all of that, too. You know, you, you everything was fine until you started to think. Then suddenly, Eden seemed like a really paltry and confining place. You may know that if you eat of the tree of knowledge, you're no longer going to wander around in this blissful state picking fruit off the trees and... Um, not worrying about anything, but at least what you're getting is real. You have to go out and yoke up a plow to an ox and sweat away in the midday sun just to get enough food to keep yourself and your offspring and family alive. Eden is better, or is it, though? <laughs> is Eden really better? Do you really want to go back in there? Um, it's the old thing about... Uh, you know, um, why do my eyes hurt in the Matrix? Well, it's because you've never used them before. <laughs> we can always um, stop the pain in your eyes. Back you go into the Matrix. No more pain in the eyes. And in the movie, one of the main characters opts to do that. He opts to go back into Plato's cave. He has seen the sunlight. He's left Eden, and he doesn't like it out there. I want to go back into the state of ignorant bliss. Um, so some people will say that the unexamined life is worth living. In fact, the, the guy in the Matrix, the fellow with the shaven head and the goatee, kind of, I um, forget what his name was, but he kind of implied that I want, not only do I want to have my knowledge erased, but I want to have my ability to discover the truth erased. <laughs> I want to go back into the Matrix and be... I don't know, Sultan of Turkey with, you know, everything I ever want to eat and as many women as I want and uh, absolute power over everything. Um, and that's the interesting thing about the Matrix, isn't it? We can all be these things. <laughs> There's no more com competition to worry about. So <sighs> our taboos are, I think, means of making the matrix workable in our lives. You don't do these things because they are not done. End of story. Cannibalism being one of the biggest taboos that we have. I guess we have other ones. We have things like pedophilia or incest or murder or things like that. Um, and, you know, they're things that generally almost every society is against. Not all societies. For example, incest is not completely unknown in terms of a sanctioned relationship in all societies. It does actually exist in certain contexts in our society, along with cannibalism and murder, even, one could say. Um, murder is bad, but under certain circumstances, it's fine, and, you know, that kind of thing. You put on a military uniform, and you shoot another guy in a military uniform, and that, in some sense, that's, that's better. It's not quite as murderous as if you just go out and randomly shoot a 
stranger. You know, shoot, shoot the night clerk in your local hotel or something like this for no reason. It's not con considered the same thing. So we do have taboos, and they're often inserted into us sublogically or subliminally, I guess, um, to the point where we don't question them. Um, you know, you, I, I get into these discussions with vegans a lot. Um, I like using uh, a lot of the arguments that <laughs> get raised by people like David Benatar. Um, you know, some, some people with children will come up to me and shame me or try to shame me um, for eating a hamburger or something like that. And I say, oh, yeah, what's more unethical, eating hamburgers or having children? And they go, oh, don't be stupid. See, that's a taboo kicking in, right? They're taking something that I consider axiomatic. In other words, I'm just eating a hamburger. There's no moral angle to this. I'm just, I went to the store with money that I earned. I bought something legally and now I'm consuming it. But this person will then say, and I'm not saying all vegetarians or vegans are like this, by the way, uh, quite the opposite, but I, I work with a few. <laughs> um, and they'll say, uh, you know what you're eating? Eh? You know how unethical all that is? Oh, really? Okay. Uh, let's see how, how ethical you are. And it's interesting because their taboo, which is, you know, they've developed a taboo against the consumption of uh, meat. Their taboo is not along the lines of don't be stupid in their minds, whereas my objection to what they're doing is in the category of don't be stupid. Um, so I might say I'm eating a hamburger because I'm hungry and, you know, my species eats meat. Um, but they'll say, well, yeah, I understand that. But think about what you're doing. Think about it. In other words, they're saying examine yourself, examine your actions, live the examined life here, look at what you're doing. And I understand that. I, I get that. In fact, I tend to agree with Socrates that the unexamined life is not worth living or may not be worth living for everybody. I'll put it that way. It's not worth living for me, that's for sure. I live to think. Um, now, so they'll say, so I'll say, well, don't be stupid. All I did was buy a hamburger and I'm now eating it. What's the moral issue here? And they say, well, when you think about it, when you eat of the tree of knowledge, suddenly you understand what you're doing is not morally neutral. Okay. Then I say to them, what are you doing that's not morally neutral? Hmm? <laughs> you know, and, and the antinatalist argument uh, it turns out to be quite useful if you want to be... Uh, uh, the kind of person that involve, in, uh, indulges in satanic advocacy, which I love doing. And so I just fire back at them. What are you doing that's so unethical? The conversation usually ends rather quickly because they, then they've just sort of disarmed themselves by sort of saying, look, you saying don't be stupid is not enough of an objection or not enough of a defense when I object to you eating the hamburger or not even object to it, but I point out the ethics of... Um, meat eating. So then I turn around and I say, well, some people that I encounter will tell me that it's unethical to breed and they will say, don't be stupid. Wait a minute. You just said that my objection of don't be stupid is not good enough. <laughs> so you got to be careful when you start to examine your life because you don't understand how deep the rabbit hole goes. And there's always somebody there waiting to outflank you, especially if, and this is unprovable, but especially if your entire motive for being a moral person is to put yourself in a position to denounce other people, <laughs> you know, like the, the stereotypical PETA type, you know, the, that, that just, uh, again, stereotypically or as a caricature, um, hates humans and loves animals and, um, you know, thinks that human life is valueless and that, hum that animal life is sacrosanct. Um, you get the distinct impression sometimes that they want to do that in order to denounce the human race. Now, again, I'm not interested in arguing that because you can't prove it. But, you know, there are some people who seem to see their ethics that way. Uh, so you do a little bit of examination, just enough to allow you to, de to denounce other people. <laughs> uh, now, of course, you get, in turn, denounced yourself. <laughs> That's inevitably what happens when denunciation becomes the way of things. You end up with something resembling the killing fields. 
So I guess what we've got then is, uh, to paraphrase whatever that 17th century English poet said, he said, a little learning is a dangerous thing. Well, I'd say a little examination is a dangerous thing because you start to think that you're smarter than everybody else, but what you've actually done is you've, you're just on a continuum. You know a little bit more than everybody else does, and this goes to your head, but somebody is far ahead of you waiting to look down on you. So always somebody has some sort of um, up on you when you're talking about things that are strictly taboo, things that are just simply not done, um, and you don't think about it anymore. Um, and I wonder sometimes just how much of our own behavior, our own motivation, our own impetus behind life itself is based upon just not thinking, just accepting things at face value. Um, when you start to put together a logical sort of formula, you have to start out with a place to stand. You have to start out with axioms. What are those axioms most of the time now? Most of the time, those axioms are simply, this is the way it is. This is the way um, of things. This is the way one acts. Comme il faut. It's just, that's how it is. Then you proceed from there. Um, and I think that that kind of is an interesting comment on how examined our lives actually are, regardless of how examined we may think that they are. Um, every, or I shouldn't say every last time that you come up with a place to stand, but a lot of the time that you come up with a place to stand, it is based on this idea that that's just the way it is. Can we establish this at the beginning? Okay, now that we've done that, what we do is we draw certain inferences from that. But you've got to remember what you've done, right? You've actually more or less arbitrarily said that things are just like this. You know, it starts off with non-harming is a good thing, right? We won't argue that anymore. Or, um, you know, uh, the Shahada, la ilaha la Muhammad Rasul Allah means there is no God but God and Muhammad is his prophet. Once you accept that, everything else comes uh, from there. Is any of that the examined life, though? Is any of that a taboo-free life? And at the end of the day, do you really want to live a taboo-free life? Um, do any of us want to live a taboo-free life? Would it really suit us? Uh, would it suit the civilization that we live in? I mentioned that I think that Socrates may have been something of an elitist when he said the unexamined life is not worth living. He might have simply said the unexamined life is not worth living for me. I can't live without examining things, without constantly asking questions doesn't apply to everybody else. Everybody else is quite happy down in the cave. I'm not. Now what? 